Okay, well, I'm a lecturer at uh, the School of uh, Industrial and Health Sciences, and um, I'm responsible for public involvement within the curriculum and also skills and practice for part three. So this talk today, I'm going to give you some information about my background, where I came from, because I've been on a long journey to, to get here. Could you ask him to the back side of the Sorry? Could you come to the other side of the hall? How's that? Is that better? Thank you. I'm trying to hide from you. <laughs> I, I, I'm hoping we don't, won't need subtitles at the end of this, but we'll try our best. So, um, I'm going to give you some information about my background, and then I'm going to talk to you about some of the challenges faced by nursing educationists in moving forward in the 21st century, certainly with the numbers of students that we have. I uh, trained, was it a training back then, in 1979, started then, and there's been a lot of changes since then. What we'll then do is focus on two elements of the current programme that we offer. One's going to look at team building and leadership, and the other element's going to look at public engagement. And then at the end, for Survive, I'm going to talk to you briefly about uh, men in nursing, because there's an initiative trying to increase the number of males coming into the profession. Now normally I would be working with PowerPoint presentation, which is behind you, and you can see it. So this is a, a new sort of phenomenon for me. So I made myself some cards, which I put in my back pocket, and I'll just occasionally refer them, because I don't want to lose any of the detail of the top. So where did it all start? Well, I was um, born in Charleston, in Dundee. You know where that is? Yeah. It's like the West's equivalent of Brody Ferry. <laughs> and from there, my family then moved from Dunholm Road to Inverkill <coughs> Place and then on to Drybra. And it was uh, quite an experience growing up in uh, Lochie in those days. Uh, everybody seemed to be the same. It wasn't, uh, as far as I was concerned, real poverty. But I must have been poor because even during the school holidays I was entitled to free school meals. So I was the eldest of five. I had four siblings and it was one year between all of us. So my mother and father had their hands full. Unfortunately, my mother developed psoriasis when I was born and that, you know, followed her throughout her life. So I had to often attend hospital to, to visit and at one point myself and my sister had to be um, fostered out because there wasn't anybody to look after us. Not many people would take five kids in at once, so my father had to go work and we had to then be looked after by foster folk. And that was an experience. So during that period, I obviously had lots of uh, friends, and many of them decided to uh, embark on a criminal career, which is uh, quite interesting. But one of the things that happened, many of them ended up on probation, and I happened to be invited to go along to one of the clubs that had been offered by the probation service. So social works had reached out in the community to try and stop further um, offences by these kids said, look, here's opportunities to do something different with your life, so we're going to offer you, you these, uh, you know, like adventure training and that kind of stuff. So up to that point, um, I had thought everybody was the same. If you want to use the phone, for example, you went to the phone box at the end of the road, not many people had a car, there wasn't any certain heating, uh, you know, double glazing, they were all something that you, you aspired to. We all had that shared experience. And I remember being at school, nobody talked about going to university. That was for somebody else. Anyway, to cut a long story short, the social work department took us on all these different activities, and part of that process was seeing how they lived. Saw the car, the clothing, talking about their holidays. On occasion, went to their house and thought, actually, is this how the, this how the other half live? This is the middle classes. I want to be better at this. So I planned then, at that point, to keep away from those heading one direction and try and focus on a different direction. So my mother was quite keen for me to stay on at school, so I did that, and I was able to get enough qualifications to be a social worker. One of the ways you could get into social work back in the day was to work in a care home. So I decided, right, okay, I'll go for that. So I started working in a care home, and I worked there for about three or four months. The person in charge was an ex-nurse, and said to me, Tom, have you thought about nursing? I thought, no, really. I'd been used to looking after my siblings, so I was quite good at keeping an eye on people and, and caring for them. She said, you should think about it. So she gave me a few books and I had to, I had to read through them. 
And I started looking at the conditions that the patients were suffering from, in the, the, the residents rather, and thought, yeah, well, I might be interested in this. So I made a decision to apply for nursing, and this all happened in a very, relatively short period of time. And suddenly I found myself sitting in a class of 48 women and three guys. So that, that was my introduction into nursing. So it was quite an eventful three years. I wasn't the best student in the world. I was always in trouble. Didn't like authority. It was routinely pulled in for, you know, have a chat. Attendance was an issue. And by this point, I'd learned to drive. I had a car, so I used to take time off to fix the car. And um, nevertheless, I got through the three years. Whilst I was on placement, because the, the way the nursing programme operates is part theory, part practice. So I, I'd been in numerous different areas, and one place I really loved was the A&E department in Wells. So while I was there, um, staff must have saw something in me. It suited my sort of personality. It was something different every day. It was exciting. You met lots of the different members of the public. You needed to have good banter, you know, to, to survive there. You had to be pretty resilient. So it was a great place to work. And when I qualified, they sent somebody along to find me. They heard it was on night duty because that was a punishment placement if you were, sure, if you were a bad student. And they sought me out and said, Tom, we want you to uh, put in for a job that's coming up. So I applied for it and I stayed there for 10 years. And it was a great place to work. Great team spirit. You look forward to going to your work every day. You thought, this is fantastic. I'm actually enjoying going to work. And, and I talked to a lot of my peers and they, they weren't having the same experience. Wasn't it all happy though? You know, you saw a lot of things happening to people that were bad. Women coming through the door, handing you a baby, you know, stop breathing, having to phone folks say, look, your daughter's just collapsed at a bus stop. Then you get the story, she's going to be at a party, and the mother had fallen out with her, but because of the way she was dressed, turns out the girls had a subarachnoid hemorrhage, she dies in the department by the time they get there. All these kind of scenarios, so they stick in your mind. Nevertheless, I worked there for approximately 10 years and then I met my future wife and she said, well, time to think about a different direction. So I applied to become a clinical teacher. So I applied to become a clinical teacher and at that point, bear in mind I only had an RGN. When you, when you did your three year programme, you, you never got any academic qualifications, you were just a nurse. So that was also part of the register, a registered clinical teacher. So I went away to do that and, and built into that programme was a diploma in nursing. So that was my first experience in academia. And I remember the essay, the first essay I wrote, uh, it wasn't particularly good, it was more like pop journalistic, and I got feedback, which was a bit disappointing then. But I realised, you know, there's more to this than meets the eye. You have to have a style and you have to understand the process. So I then became a clinical teacher. I travelled through to Perth every day, came back, um, and at that time the profession was in a state of transition. They decided to move to an all-graduate profession. So it was incremental, we started with diploma, then became the, the, the graduate part of it. And all clinical teachers then had to be upgraded to become a lecturer. So all got sent through to uh, Jordan Hill in Glasgow, we spent a year there, and we were given a certificate in education, that allowed you to teach in higher education. So I came back, thought, oh, that's good, I can have a seat now. Unfortunately, oh no, you now need to have a degree to teach to degree level. So I had to then head up to Dundee, um, well it's Aberdeen now, and do a BA, a BA in community health. Finished that, and then again was the further escalation, oh you need to now do a master's, so I had to then go away and do a master of public health at Dundee University. So it took me a lot of years, there was a lot of transitioning to have to go through that process, and I often think to myself, well I was 40 when I got my master's degree, why is it taking so long? Why did somebody not identify me and that and me at the start and say, you need to do this? So, Part of the story I'm about to tell you in a minute, that's what I'm trying to do now for kids from MD20 areas in Dundee, because that's where I came from. I would be in classes in MD20 people. And give them an opportunity, show them that they have aspirations so they can go on and do something with their life. You with me up to now? Yeah. Yeah? Okay, so. Some of the challenges. The first challenge is back in the day when I was a student, any nurses here? <laughs> yeah, well, maybe you know as old as me and Major. So what happened was, in the in the in your program, there was a lot of what they call chalk and talk. You would have a book, and you would read from it, and write it on the board. You then copied it down, 
on your piece of paper, and at the end of the week you got a test. And if you pass the test, you can move on to the next test. And it went on like that. And clinical skills, for example, was taught in a, in a room of 50 folk, and you would get a demonstration, Sage on the stage would show you how to do the, the, the skill, and then if you were lucky, you got a chance to practice. But because it's 50, you have one mannequin, that was kind of difficult. So, that was the sort of educational experience I had. And you, you were meant to pick all the, 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 these techniques up on placement. But unfortunately, when you went on placement, you often picked up bad habits, depending on where you went. So, <laughs> fast forward um, to what we're currently doing. So what we've got now is instead of having a cohort of 50 students, we have cohorts of 400 plus. This year we're actually down because there's a national shortage, we're, 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 there's a 23% shortage in, in recruitment uh, this year across the UK. And we now have a, an intake of 400, and that's split across two campuses. So if you imagine 400 students in the first year, we've got 460 in second year, and there's 440 in third year. You put all them together, that's a lot of students in the system. And, like all big organisations, universities are very different. We've had to be operate smarter, and we've to have, to have to cut back staffing levels. So we'll have to be more efficient what we do. One of the challenges is it's now a graduate profession. So you're getting folk coming in, and they have to become uh, develop graduate skills. So one of the things we don't want to do is be spoon-feeding them all the time. They have to think on their feet to be able to initiate things themselves. And they have to engage with the material themselves without having to be chased up all the time. So they're, they're, they're major challenges, but we find that all the time. Students don't look at emails, they don't look at the material before sessions, they pitch up. So um, we've tried to structure the programme, certain elements where that isn't, you can't do that. You have, to, you have to actually be involved in it from when you get the initial lecture right through to the actual deployment and, and see how you have mastered that particular subject area. And, and I'm going to come back to that in a minute. The next problem we've got is People leaving school are not particularly physically fit. And if you've been following in the newspaper, it's, it's uh, nine out of ten kids don't know or don't do the one hour activity of exercise each day that they're meant to. So what we're getting is through the, through the front door when they come in, a lot of them can't do some of the skills. So for example, if you have to do BLS, basically support, and you have to do it for 20 minutes, half of them can, can't manage it for three minutes. So that's a, that's a major issue. And particularly when you're trying to advise somebody on health promotion and you're obviously not taking your own advice. So that's an issue. And the profession, the NMC are in the process, and NMC is the Nursing Midwifery Council, they're in the process of rewriting the standards for education and they've highlighted that as an issue. That's a big, big issue. It's because, believe it or not, we're all going to have to work toward near 70. So, it'll be interesting to see how the nurses going through nine miles front door with their zimmers, head towards the wards. I don't know how that's going to work. Because it is a hard, hard job. And everything has been thought through properly, so it's all changed. So there's a physical resilience element, but there's also an emotional element issue because a lot of students that come through now have low mood and anxiety related disorders, and that's not just the nursing; that's across the whole university. So we've now got an army of people trying to solve these problems. Routinely, we've got 30, 40 students from an intake that have to be temporarily withdrawn because they can't cope with the program. So that, that's, a, that's a, a, an issue for the whole society. I can't give you the answer to why that's happening, but there's, there's been several theories suggested. So the, these elements are important. The other thing that we'll have to do is, again, it's in the NMC's new standards, they are keen on having team building and leadership embedded in the programme. And there's a reason for that, because if you think back to the mid-staffs inquiry of Francis report, it was clearly identified that poor care related directly to poor teamwork and weak leadership. So we've got to think of ways we can embed that to make sure that our students can be part of the team, understand that, understand the role, and have leadership and able to speak out on behalf of patients. Because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter whether we're trained 1979, 1959, today we've all got the same sort of view of what a nurse should be like in terms of the qualities that we're looking for. So, the first part of the story, team building and leadership, how are we going to incorporate that in a programme when you've got 400 odd students? So the way I've done it is by linking up with 225 Medical Management Scotland. The Army are experts in team building and leadership. And we're not marching about and having them salute, 
you know, put them through in the salt course. What, what we've done is we've created a series of activities where they have to go around command tasks. And the command tasks are designed to galvanise them as a unit. So they stick together. The other reason why teamwork's important is because in healthcare, it's been demonstrated clearly that if you've got good teamwork, then you've got better patient outputs. So it's an, it's an imperative. You should have good teamwork. End of story. So we um, have hooked up with... Uh, 225 Medical Regiment, and they have bases in Dundee and also in Glen Office. So what happens in first year, as soon as the students come through the door, so they come in for the first three blocks of theory before they go on the three blocks of practice, we organise uh, exercise team spirit for the students. So it's based up in Dalkeith Road in Dundee and over in Glen Office. So the five students go to Glen Office to do it, the Dundee students uh, come at Dundee, up at Dalkeith Road. And they then work around the command tasks. Once they've finished that exercise, we evaluate it and it's, the feedback's come back very positively. We then wait until they're at the end of first year, moving into second year, and we do another exercise called Exercise Team Resilience. Now, these command tasks are all about team building and leadership, but they've also got embedded within them elements which create physical exertion which means you develop physical resilience, because you have to run around them and do them. They're, they're hard, they're not easy. And you need, you need emotional resilience, because part of the process of being in a team is listening to other people, okay, not having your views considered. There might be a challenge at that particular stand, and then as you move on, you have to then bounce back quickly. And that's what emotional resilience means. It's being able to bounce back from a, a negative event, which you happen to have to do a lot in nursing. So team resilience is based on the major incident, and again, it's based on a, a proper incident, so you've got medical planning, uh, you have to build a medical facility if you scratch, it's a big army tent, so the four of them have to build that way out the way it's meant to be. You then do triage, so you've got a big massive tent that's full of smoke, they've got a fogging device, there's ten people in there, you've got to retrieve them one by one, you've then to triage them, so you code them T1, 2, T, T2, T3, depending on the severity of the, the, their condition. And you have to do that under a time pressure. Because both of these are run as a competition. So there's, there's all these different elements within it. There's a trauma element, there's a medical calculation element, there's all these different things. And then by doing that, the students have that related theory at that point, they've just touched on it, it flags up in their mind that these are important things and I need to be able to do these as I move forward in the programme. So the, the plan is hopefully to follow that up in third year and uh, complete that exercise but doing a major field hospital so it's a major event and it's, it's got different field elements. Now when I say it's in a field but we've also got fields of nursing so it's adult, mental health and child so we have to have elements embedded in it that meets the, those students needs. Okay I'm going to have a drink. <laughs> How are we doing for time? I usually spend my time. You're about 20 minutes in. Okay, right, here we go then for the second part. So the next part's public involvement. So in order to make the in order to make the programme realistic and authentic, we involve the public in our teaching. So we ask members of the public to come and know us. I notice we've got some simulated patients from Rain Wells here. Yes, so we've got actually doing in St Andrews. Okay, in St Andrews. So so we use what we ask for folk to volunteer to be simulated patients, but the School of Nursing have additional simulated patients. We've got secret car share simulated oh. patients. <laughs> and the reason we've recruited different folk is because generally you, it's hard to get people during the day unless they're retired. Mm -hmm. And often they're ex-professional. So what we've tried to do is we've tried to cast our net a wee bit further. So in third year we're looking at non-technical skills. So we we'll focus on technical skills in first and second year. So they're things like taking a pulse, blood pressure, temperature. Non-technical skills are things like decision making, Situational awareness, team building and communication. They're, they're, they're called soft skills, but they're very important because patient safety depends on them being able to do them. So what we've done is we've, we've hooked up, we've collaborated and we've got partnerships now with the Dundee International Women's Centre. So we'll have folk who are from a black and minority ethnic group coming in. They've got 500 women on their books. Often they find it difficult to get work because they, they don't recognise their qualifications in the UK and they often lack an opportunity to practice their English. So we have them come in. Now rather than me say, right folks, here's what I want you to do, there you are, read that and, and you know, play this part, we've said to them, we would like you to tell us what the situation is out in your community and we will then generate the scenarios based on what your experience is. So they, they generate the material. When we deliver the session, they provide the students the feedback. 
So they're part of the team. So when we run these immersive, what they call immersive simulations, it's a whole team approach. So we've got all the different elements that we we'll bring in, facilitators, we've got clinical staff, academic staff, and the students, and we then provide, well, allow the opportunity to provide feedback. So they're, they're directly involved in delivering the programme. So we've got folk from the Dundee National Women's Centre. We've also got folk from uh, Castle Huntley Open Estate. Do you know where that is? Yeah. So that's an open prison. And what we've done there is we've uh, teamed up with the staff in the health centre and we've said to them, look, could you identify any folk that would be willing to volunteer to come and be simulated patients? So they, they, they come along and we've been you know, working together now for about three or four years. We've had over 100 odd simulated patients from Castle Huntley no any problems at all, they're superb, staff love them, they say they're great, they're authentic, they bring a realism to the situation that is quite difficult to find. They've got a lot of experience in some of the areas we're looking at, sexual health, substance misuse. Uh, we'll have them coming in for diabetic simulations, some are diabetic, some have had amputations, this kind of stuff. So they're, they're fantastic. They've, they've been great, they've been a revelation. And the final group we use are kids from what we class as MD20 schools. Now MD20 schools are multiple deprivation zones in, in Dundee. So they're, they're the 20% they're the of schools where you've got low uptake in higher education. So we're targeting those schools. And there's a, there's a project called Lift Off which goes in and identifies kids who've got potential, says, right, have you ever thought about a career in nursing? Or have you ever thought about a career doing this? And it, it says to them, you need to think about that carefully, these are the qualifications you need. And then they try and hook up with organisations to give them an opportunity. And that's where I come in. Because I'm running these immersive simulations, you know, they're on an industrial scale. It takes six days to process the whole intake of students on both campuses. I can offer kids from school an opportunity to be a nurse for a day. So and initially, I thought, the last one would be Shannon, a 15 year old who's been having unprotected sexual in their course and has missed a period. I thought, that, 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 I'll chance my arm asking them to do that, but they, they signed up to it no problem at all, so they engaged with it fully. So they're basically, the, bear in mind, they're fifth and sixth year pupils. So I was surprised that they engaged with that, and, they, and they, they were fantastic. So staff from the sexual health department sat in with them, and they said they were brilliant. So that was a surprise, but they, they made a big difference to the quality of the session, because it's hard to get young people to be part of your curriculum, for obvious reasons. So we started off with nine, and that was in 2016. This year, however, there was a tsunami of people wanting to do it. So I ended up with 41. Obviously, I couldn't have slot them all into the station, so I decided instead that we would just slot them where we could. So we had 41 showing interest. Of the first nine, I think nine of them went on to do nursing, and in this 41, I think there's quite a significant number showing interest in doing it. So that not only did I get a chance to be a student, because we, we, we integrate them into the station the student, but if they want to, they can be the simulated patient as well. Any, so I'll get questions ahead. So that, that's the public involvement element. So we're, we're trying to increase that in the scope of that. Uh, each time we look at an element in the programme, where can we bring the public in? Men in nursing, finally. Men in nursing has always been an issue, to be perfectly honest. Back in the day, there were shorter men for mental health nursing, so they gave men uh, an enhanced uh, pension scheme, they were able to retire much earlier, they, they were given you know, enhancements in terms of their salary, they also were given clothing allowance, shoe allowance, there were, there were all sorts of things to induce folk to come into nursing. Now, when I was a student in 1979, I had three guys in my class, and if you work that out, that's 6%, if, if you work it out, out the, 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 if we had 100 in the class, for example, it's only three, uh, three of us in the total of 50, so it's 6%. Today it's running about 8% and the plan is to increase that significantly because you're only targeting or recruiting from half the population if you think about it, the majority of folk are, are, are women, so we need to think about that and I, and I think it's tied in with the whole question about masculinity and um, what it is to be a man and, and whether you can do that job properly. But when you speak to patients they say, oh I like the male nurse and even the term male nurse is actually quite you know, strange, why, why would you say male nurse and a female nurse? So that, that's what they'll say to you. But they enjoy that sort of banter in the ward. Certain things you obviously can't do, but there's a different dynamic to that relationship with patients. So, going back to my story about the army. One of the other things we've been doing is working with the Development Young Workforce for Dundee and Angus. And they heard about the activities with 225 Medical Regiment, in particular Team Spirit, because they've got a problem in transition. 
from bringing kids in from primary school into secondary school. Because it's at that point they, they notice that there's often issues with their mental health and, and, and slotting in and fitting in and feel part of something. So they said to me, would you be able to run something like that based on the model for kids at school? I thought, okay, let's have a look at it. So we decided that we could. So we went back to them and said, yeah, let's do it. We'll use the same command tasks, we'll make it, we'll give it a health focus, a caring focus, and uh, we'll run it. So last week we ran it up in Webster's High in Kirrimere with 200 participants. They really enjoyed it. Uh, it was uh, interesting to say the least. Some of the, some of the kids and some of them were superb. I recruited uh, five child field students to participate uh, because it's again it's about recruitment long term. If, if you've got a high profile, you're in, in there routinely, then they see us and, and associate us with the with nursing profession. The challenge I've got is getting men to come and help male, males, male students to come in and participate. And when I looked at the figures for lift off of the 41 and the nine, not one of them was a male. But they were all females. So what we've done is we're going to then work on that, we're going to cascade that down. We've already had feedback from the school, they thought it was fantastic, and we're now going to pilot it at St Paul's in Dundee. So we're now going to roll that out. Uh, the only challenge I've got is going to how I'm going to service that with students. But I'm thinking if we do service it, what we can do is we can embed that experience into some sort of authentic piece of assessment. So it's actually based on a real life event. So it makes it realistic for students. Rather than trying to give them a theoretical piece of work, you're actually going to base it on a reflective piece where they've actually had to work with kids in a, in a, uh, you know, in a school environment. So that's the plan. Um, further on, because the children are young, the, the, the military can't be involved if you're under 14. So they're planning on coming in with us uh, you know, in third or fourth year and we'll do something like team resilience which is going to be more focused and it will be more challenging. And uh, the, the plan is to, to continue that process through the, the, the different stages of the, the you know, child's uh, transition through the, the state system. And hopefully by the time they're ready to leave, there will be aspirations there that, yeah, I want to be a nurse or I want to go into a career in care. How are we doing for time? That must be it. Yeah. Okay, folks, thanks very much. Thank you.